Uh, my name is Michael Kentoff. I am with the Caribbean, and I'm a songwriter, and I'm talking to uh, Jonathan Evison, who's an actual writer, and um, this is his newish book. It's not really a new book. It's a new paperback. Yeah. It's a newish book, uh, The Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, and it's, it's very, very dark and humorous, and uh, it's really a beautiful book, and so we're just going to talk about creative process, the nature of writing. Um, Jonathan's all like, oh, great. And uh, was, we're going to talk about that a little bit. You know, you, you were in a band, right? Yeah. Did you write songs? <clears throat> yeah, I wrote lyrics. Um, I, uh, I can actually sing. I actually have perfect pitch, but I never used that in my, you know, musical career, which lasted from the time I was about 13 till 17. Okay. I was in a punk band in Seattle called March of Crimes, and, you know, a lot of my old bandmates went on to you know, uh, you know, Stone went on to uh, Pearl Jam, and Ben went on to Soundgarden, and um, you know that was a very instructive experience for me to watch I my bet. friends uh, to to watch my friends kind of blow up and, and see who dealt with it well and who didn't deal with it well, and it, it's been you know. If you want to dish the dirt, you know. Oh you no, know. there's no dirt to dish. I mean, uh, I learned so much going up in the punk scene in Seattle as a teenager. I learned. I mean, that that ethos is still with me. That DIY ethos, that uh, community building. Um, it's, n it's not a snarky music scene. At least it wasn't then. Back right. then, you know, I mean, everybody tried to support and help everybody else. Well, that's sort of the, that's actually sort of the, the kind of the tipping point thing is when does a constructive, healthy community become a scene that is snarky and fascist? I mean, it's always the tricky thing. And it seems to happen almost anywhere that something that, so, that starts out very communal, something flips and it becomes an exclusive thing, you mm -hmm. know? So it's... But you I got out before that, that happened. I get, you know, I think that moment probably happened in the in the early '90s when the A and R guys started showing up. Before right. that, it was just a very insular scene, a great regional punk rock scene. And I always, you know, I would spend my summers in L.A. and San Francisco because my parents and my grandparents were down there, and uh, it was just never the same down there. It just it right. wasn't the same feeling of community. It was very, uh, you know, San Francisco. You, you had your Nazi punks over here and your mods over here. It was very, uh, you know, uh, categorical and very uh, separate. In Seattle, it was just a just one group, you know, it was about right. 60, 70 of us, really. You know. No, that is great. It's a nice, it's a healthy way to kind of come up as an artist, even if you're not going to do music, just to see, oh, so there's a dynamic where people actually root for each other and help each other and donate their time and energy into somebody else's thing because it's cool. Yeah, it's I mean, that's been my platform, is just to try to just generally improve the ecology of independent publishing. I help everybody I can. I'm a... I'm what they call a generous reader, meaning I'm happy to read people's books and blurbs. You know, um, happy to trumpet other writers. I, I don't consider myself much of a reviewer. I'm more of a coverer. Right. You know what I mean? If I like a book, I like to get behind it, uh, blog about it, um, mention it in interviews, things right. like that. But I, I'm not somebody who likes to go out there and, and, and uh, you know, cut anybody else's work now. Right, right. Well, that's understandable. There's, there's, there's karma. There's karma, among other things. You, um, I think I think I saw something that you said so, that somebody that, that nobody's first novel is their first novel, which I think is interesting because aside from the fact that I used to write fiction and just sucked at it, but had to. Hey, so does it. Leonard Cohen, and so does Bob Dylan. So you're in good. You know, it's a hard to it's hard to cross over. If you have ever tried to read Tarantula, man. oh yeah, no, I have, novel. and it's not. You know, at some point you have to just sort of accept. You know what? It's not me. It's that this isn't good, you know. Yeah. But you have to sort of accept that. That's sort of the. That's okay. I just said that about Dylan. Lightning didn't strike me yeah. dead. Cool. All right. Well, and I will say that Leonard Cohen, for me, can stand toe to toe with any poet of the 20th century. I mean, nobody writes about despair like him. No. Nope. I mean, it's all about the words with him. Otherwise, he just sounds like some dude, you know, burning his arms with hot candle wax or something. Right. Blah, 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 blah. You know, but it's all about the words. They're 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 magical, but it doesn't make a novice. And you know, I mean, I couldn't write songs. The dictates are just so different, you know. Oh, I, 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 speaking from this side of it, I can, I can understand. And, and, and what I thought was interesting was that, you know, it, it sort of it reinforces this notion that, especially if you love something, you have to fail and fail and fail and fail before the success. And after the success, and this is where I actually, this is partially a question. After the success, there's more failure. You know, oh yeah, you, the, the, the humiliation never ends. It I never mean, ends. Dude, yeah. I did a, a, a event in Barnes and Noble last night, you know, with like two people. You know what I mean? It was like 50 empty folding chairs. And then, you know, 
Then there's nights I do a theater with 600 people. You know what I mean? It just, it's, but the humiliation never ends. And I, I actually think that's important. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, failure is ultimately so much more important than, uh, you know, success. I, absolutely. And also, I mean, I, let me ask you this, though. I mean, you've got to the point now where you're a published novelist. You just finished your fourth novel, I think. Do you have those, mo you know, when you're starting a novel, when you know that you're into a novel that you're like, eh, this could be pretty good, does that guarantee finishing or are you throw? Oh yeah, out? I always finish. I mean, like, you know, my first three novels were terrible. I mean, I physically dug a hole and buried them in the earth. I mean, salted the earth so nothing would ever grow again, and, and which was more ceremony than they deserved. But I mean, I knew I had to finish them. Um, you know, I mean, like, I was 18, 19 when I wrote my first novel. And by the time the thing was done, it was a novel about a 19-year-old guy trying to write a novel. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. I, I, I've always approached it more like an athlete. Do you know what I mean? I, I realize to get good at something, you just have to work and work and work. And, and, yeah. and you just have to be disciplined. And like, you know, there's those mornings where it's raining out and you gotta go run your stairs. And that's how it is with writing. There's, there's days when I don't really have the wherewithal to write or maybe I'm hung over or something like that. But I, I make myself sit my butt in the chair and do it and, and just power through. And those end up being yep. some of my most productive days, you know? Oh yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I can speak for me. I have a job and I get home at night and I don't really feel like recording or working. You know, and, and but once you get into it, it, it time just flies by, and you've got all this stuff that you did. Exactly, so and I, that's how you know. know you're doing what you want to do, man. The time is just not an issue; it just goes away. When I sit down at the typewriter, I disappear. I say typewriter, but you know, word processor. I mean, literally, I go under. I mean, it's almost like yoga. You know what I mean? It's about shedding myself, getting inside the story, yeah, and then. Uh, I look up at the clock and it's, you know, five hours have passed. All right, well, yeah, on that, let me ask you this. Do you remember writing scenes in books or is it just there, you know you did it, but? I remember living scenes in books, to be quite honest with you. You know, I'm not smelling the, own, smelling the coffee on my own breath or anything like that. I mean, I, I, it actually feels like something lived to me, like a genuine experience. Like, I feel like, you know, I crossed the Olympic mountains in 1889 because, man, I was there. Sensually, I was, my senses right. were engaging. You know, and the great thing is I never had to get out of my slippers. You know? so that's slippers are the, nice to, yeah, not, to get out, not to have to get out of, I know. Um, well, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, you know, the experience of writing a song was we have a, we all have a record out. And I don't remember writing the songs. As, I, mean, I know I did. It's not that out of body. But there's a, the, the drudgery of working on it doesn't touch me. And, and because... The, the reward of having of doing it and having done it is so so enriching that I just that's all I, that's all I think of so I, I always wonder what it's like. a novel is a lot longer process being ADD it's one of the reasons I don't like it to be a novelist I just can't focus on one thing it's interesting because being ADD is one of the reasons I am a novelist because right. it's the only thing that allows me to edit myself and slow down I'm a very much a spiral man I'm like a John Coltrane sax solo or something right. once I get going I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth my, my biochemistry is so geared so high that uh you know the only two things that really kind of keep it in check are, are alcohol and, and writing um but I wanted to ask you something about music which is uh well, well first of all like when you write songs is this just you in a room or is this you in collaborate do, do, do you guys as a band sort of like you know when you get together kind of build them together or is this you coming into band practice saying look I wrote this song last night for the most part it's me writing a song and then uh, I may even start recording it and then getting the other guys involved and they bring something and change the song you know they bring something I mean in a way they're almost more arrangers but sometimes the arrangements they bring in change the song, so we just share the credit oh, because totally. it's, you know, yeah. it, it makes it uh, from something that might be kind of cool and interesting to something alive. Something yeah. It's fully a breathing organism. So uh, it's, it's a really rewarding process. I, I think like you, and I, you know, had to do it really horribly for years before there was a method that I could sort of plug into. And it changes, but it's, it's more consistent now. I know how to tap in. I always worry that the uh, that the song well will run dry. You know, like uh, I'm out of songs. Like I've written my allotment. You know. I could see that. That would be scary because there's just a you know there's a limited amount of chord progressions. There's a, I mean, do you know what I mean? For me, I never really have that worry with fiction because there's an unlimited amount of characters, and character is always sort of my uh, you know nexus for a novel. It's mm -hmm. just this. It's a character arc. Here is my character. This is his life, and this is my character's ideal life. All he can stumble. The rest of it is just a big human obstacle course. Right. 
as he tries to or she tries to grope their way to this to this uh, you know benchmark over here and, and uh, so luckily I'm not a high concept guy I mean I, I know writers that struggle with ideas and it takes them years to get ideas and for me I mean I never I, I never started anything with like an idea like that so much as, as much as a as just a character or a, you know in the tick case of you know west of here which has got you know 60 characters and it's told from 42 limited points of view in my conception there was really only one character and that was the town of port bonita everybody right. else was there to serve them so it was like uh you know like nabokov talked about his his characters as his galley slaves you know he liked to move them around and and, mm -hmm. and use them to suit his purposes and for me it's the opposite for me i, I write to try to become a more expansive person i write to uh you know I think it's just the greatest empathic window ever created by humanity. Like I can literally walk a mile in someone else's shoes. So I try right. to write about people that aren't me. I don't. I try to write about what I don't know. Do you know what I mean? This is a, this is a, it's so funny meeting you because this is a conversation. I mean, even though I think you know you cross over back and forth, that's exactly my my feeling has always been write what you don't know. Be smarter after you write the thing, whether it's a book or a song. You know, I don't. And I know that there's a lot of autobiography in, in, in this novel. Particularly you know, in that in one, this, yeah. Particularly in this one. But still, you know, um, well, I would assume not, not Trev. That's a, that's a creation. No, well, not really. <laughs> no? The, guy, the, kid, the, the kid the book's based on is very much, uh, you know, uh, the, oh, it's dedicated to him. My friend Case. I just spoke oh, to him okay. for an hour and a half on the phone yesterday. And uh, kid's a big, big inspiration to me. But yeah, that character is very much kind of based on my experience as a caregiver. This book is a departure for me because, it, just, because yeah. it is so, I mean, I've written 13 books actually when you count all the unpublished stuff. And of all of them, this is by far the one that is most personally informed by my life, uh, particularly the emotional landscape of the book. Certain things are different, you know? I didn't lose my kids, but my parents lost a kid on her right. 16th birthday. And, and, but I was a caregiver and I, you know, I did take similar road trips with, with, with Case. I mean, he and I, he and I probably logged about a good 50, 60,000 miles. We went to Yellowstone, wow. we, went to, we went to Glacier, we went to Orlando, Florida, we went to San Francisco, we went to Crater Lake, you know, so. I'm gonna switch gears and talk about music though for a second because yeah. I'm trying to figure out how, see, I, you know, music totally informs my writing, but I'd be hard pressed to say how. Uh, because you know, like, my favorite time to lis listen to music is just to like, kind of get drunk up my ass and maybe lay on my back and just, pretty much just kind of cripple my language centers mm -hmm. and then just let it wash over me. And uh, sometimes I'm inspired to, I get the creative impetus to try to create something because of something I've heard. I remember when uh, like that Neutral Milk Hotel record, which I didn't like the couple the, the, in the airplane over the sky. Yeah. First time I listened to the record, I was like, yeah, the guy's voice kind of annoys me or something like that. But then I got into it and I started to get like this jumbled mixed up thing with his dysfunctional childhood and these visions of Anne Frank and his bad biochemistry and stuff and it, it, it ended up being this like amazing decoupage of an album and I was like I kind of want to write a novel that does that but you know I, I mean I didn't really know how to approach it and uh, I mean I'm just at some point I would like to sort of try to bridge that gap like I mean I was talking to I talked to all my rock and roll friends about this like especially the readers uh, uh, like why is the great rock and roll novel so elusive I mean, a lot of people attempt the rock and roll novel, and uh, some of them have been there, and some of them are just tourists, but like, yeah. it's really hard, and I guess it's just because the experience of music is so much more visceral. Um, like, I don't know. Well, I think in a book, there's some aspect of, when you're reading it, especially if you love rock music, if you love music, the smallest thing will tip you off of, uh, uh, of sort of disingenuousness, or something that doesn't feel right. And whereas a book about something else might not set those alarms off so rapidly, the book about rock and roll, you're fine-tuned for that. Even if you don't play, you're just a huge music guy. Like, wait a second, that's, you know, that doesn't, that, I think that's one of the reasons it's hard to capture because... And maybe the characters are unsympathetic too. Do you know what I mean? Well, you know what I mean? It's like some skinny, <laughs> some skinny dude is like living on his girlfriend's couch and doesn't have a job and gets to get up every right. Friday and Saturday night and be worshipped like, you know. Well, where's, the, where's the club. story? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. It's like, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I know a lot of musicians, obviously. Um, musicians' life is a lot of sitting around and waiting. You know, I mean. Talk you know, to Ringo Starr about right. <laughs> that. You know, like, that poor son of a bitch spent like, you know, countless hours during uh, Sergeant Pepper's just like until they finally sent him home and then Paul did the drums right, you know? right. it's like 
Yeah, well, that's that's. But studio, but on tour. I mean, the, the, when you're on the road, it's all hurry up and wait. You get somewhere, so you can check in and wait. Yeah, I yeah. feel that now. I mean, I'm on the road. You know, the great thing about this is I'm not in a Econoline van with five farting teenagers. You know what I mean? I, at least I got or my own hotel room, my very own lotion. You know <laughs> no, what I mean? No, it's, it's like five forty <laughs> farting forty year olds either. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. The farts don't get any better. <laughs> you know. So I mean, I, 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 no, I think it's right. I was actually saying that to Rich. We were talking beforehand. I'm like, you know, the cool thing about this, and I love my bandmates, and there's only two of them on the road, and that's great, and they're. Dear friend, so you're a three piece, or, three piece, or when yeah. you tour, you're we three tour piece. a three piece, and then when you record, record you add a few who, people. Yeah, or who you know, other people contribute with. There's two other guys in particular who who are, are part of it, but um, we really genuinely like each other a lot. We love each other. We really I mean, I think you have to. You, well, otherwise, it it's going to be it's like a marriage. I mean, oh, it, it literally is like a marriage with four, so. three to five people, and, and and it's. I mean, it's you know. The Beatles only lasted seven years, you know right. what I mean? Six and a half, really, and then they released a couple of, I mean, no, that's, it's true. I, that's how hard it is, I think. Like, it is hard, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I think comes comes up is that, um, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about it in terms of what you're doing, your, your tour, is that everybody who's ever been in a band, and like I said, even the guys that I I play with, who I, who I love, not a one of us has a thought. What would it be like just to go somewhere alone and do this? Just because not you know, that's not what the front man ends up doing not every negoti- time. Well, I'm the front man. I guess it's going to happen. Is that there's no Your negotiation? Solo project. No negotiation. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, one thing I actually wanted to ask you because this relates to music and it relates to in some ways it relates to the Beatles because actually Rich and I were talking about one of our favorite records, which is Ram by Paul McCartney. Dude, I grew up with that album, and all my friends go, "Oh, Ram, you mean really awful music?" I love it. I think that. I mean, I don't know that. Maybe it's because I'm sentimental, but like Monk, Mary, Moon, Delight, all that stuff. I love that record. I actually love Linda's vocals on it. Yeah. Monk, Mary, Moon, Delight. Her vocals are scary, weird. New York, it's cool. Yeah, that's cool that you like that album. Not very many people do. It's a beautiful record. I think it's Every one of those Beatles made a great first solo album. You know, George Harrison's maybe the best. but well, like, maybe. Well, that Ram was his second record, but like... Uh, Point like, taken. Yeah. First record's good. The first record's Plus, the good, band is great. Yeah. You know? But, you know, but that actually brings an interesting question, and that is... Why did all of them kind of end up sucking? And, and, and this is sort of a, I've always had this notion that I think that, I know why I write music and why I'm in a band, and that is to, I, I want to connect with people that I may never meet. I, I, that connection is what's important. And once you have that, especially in droves in their case, do you lose a little bit of your edge? Do you lose a little bit of your, your want and your hunger? And my, my question for you is, you know, you wrote for a long time. Nobody knowing about it. You buried some. Oh, of the literally, books, right? my mom wasn't reading it. Right. You know? Nobody was reading it. You were and, and and you were doing it just because this is what I need to do to be satisfied in my life. But you know when so all about Lulu comes out, it gets published for one thing, yeah. and then it gets a readership. It gets some reviews. It gets some readerships, and then of course Western Here comes out, and then it you have some readers. Did that affect you as a writer to think, well, okay, that is, there's there are people paying attention now. Does that affect the way you approach it? In a, I guess in a conscious way. If we're unconscious, you yeah. wouldn't know. It's a great question, and it should, but it doesn't. I mean, because, you know, I was doing this for so long with no publication, with no, you know, I mean, no I do this to, you know, it's, it's totally for me. I mean, the things that have changed is my schedule's a little busier. I got 80 travel days a year. and But, you know, kids do the same thing to that. And, and I just got to take it right. out of my sleep. But, like, uh, I mean, like I was alluded to earlier, like just watching friends sort of... Uh, gain audience in rock and roll and become rock stars and stuff that that was very instructive to me too i mean i i, I really and it was uh, uh, after all said and done it was kind of an exercise in keeping it real do you know what i mean yeah sure so like sure. uh you know you don't believe your own press you don't you know what i mean you just you just never forget why you're doing this i mean i feel very lucky like all the success awards bestseller that stuff that's like you know this is a big fat cherry on top of this great ice cream sundae but you know if it all went away tomorrow man i'm still writing books and so yeah like i'm on the road I'm kind of weary right now. I've done like 10 cities in 12 days. You know, my dog's having spinal problems back at home. My kid's teething. And like half of me is like, you know, there. And But like, I mean, I, I picked up my the, the manuscript I'm working at on right now a couple days ago in, the, in my hotel room. And it really just brought me back down to earth. This is why I'm doing this. Because it's hard. I mean, it's fun. I drink beer and I do do events like this and yeah, ping pong sure. bars. And But, you know, I mean, like, why I'm really doing this is for the work. And I, I was reading that book and I, I mean, my heart was literally swelling because I couldn't wait to get back to work. I was That's so excited about the work. And so the best. I think if you're grounded in that, I mean, you know, and I have met, you know, 
I think that that writing is just such an exercise in humiliation, generally speaking. Even once you're a published author, that most people are pretty good at keeping it real. But you know, now and then you'll meet somebody who believes their own press a little bit, or maybe they got a little big too quick, and and and, yeah. and I think it changes them. And and you know. I'm not really very interested in hanging out with those people. And maybe they don't do good art anymore. Maybe the art suffers. I mean, I, I think that's. I think in music, it's more likely to happen that you you see a little bit more of that. I, there's a media gratification in music because the performance aspect of it, um, and maybe that's why that in music it seems to be a bigger problem. I think in literature, it's still it's still a solo craft. So. Whatever distractions there are, ultimately it's you and the word processor in your eyes, and, so and the reader, and the reader. In a way, it's not a solo craft. In a way, it is. Uh, I think uh, more collaborative than almost any art. I mean, no other art form really invites the end user to make the connections. To, oh, you're to, whispering to actually, in their ear, yeah. And uh, you know, I depend on the reader, and I and, and when I say reader, it's just me. Do you know what I mean? Like the book I want to read, but I'm always aware of, uh, you know. Things like you know, not being too too overt, and allowing allowing the reader to make connections, and allowing you know that's like a dance you do with the reader, and, and uh, I think it's kind of um, you know in, in literary circles, I think it's a little bit of uh, you know a, it's looked down upon sometimes among certain literary circles to thinking of the reader because that sounds like you're pandering, but not at all because right. I look at the reader as like the greatest uh, tool I have in my belt. And I'm not sure it works that way with music. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't, you know, when I think about reader, I'm not talking about demographics. Like, you know what no, I mean? No, no, I know. It's just no. like, what's getting me off and, and how can I make this experience right. You're putting more yourself in the, tactile. You're, you're playing a role. And, and I think in some ways it does, because certainly I've always said if, if people were making our records, I would do something else. In other words, I mean, I, I feel like we're filling a, filling a, a, a gap that's, that needs to be filled. And I listen for things that I want to hear and experience. So, and I have to, you're saying the reader, and, and just because there's more of them, doesn't mean the reader's changed. No yeah. more than you've changed. Yeah, no, the I reader's mean, just you know, me. The reader's you, so you have the same standard of. Being if you can please yourself, you can please a lot of people. <laughs> Believe me, I know, I can please myself. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, this is a, to bring this back to the book, I think it's interesting because this book really, to me, is, it, aside from being autobiographical, it's really about. You become a writer in a lot of ways because because it hmm. because because of the fact that you know writing and again this is based on some of the things that I read and in an interview that I watched but but and you didn't say this so I'm not oh yeah, 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 yeah but, go for it. I'm, but I'm all ears writing as 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 your salvation of, of sort of attending to that garden and and being devoted to it for it not for any other reason just because you love it and and you think it's important. And and this 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 character is thirty nine. You were around forty when you kind of had a your for lack of a better word come to Jesus moment. Yeah. Well, and that book yeah it was definitely cathartic. It allowed me to uh, you know the book before this book West of Here was such a uh, technical and formal challenge. You know what I mean? I mean forty two limited points of view, a bifurcated timeline, uh, you know, a very wide scope, very epic or whatever. And it was more of a uh, I guess I would characterize it a little more of an intellectual exercise and a formal exercise. And um. I'm trying to swing for the fences every time. You know what I mean? I'm trying to reinvent myself every book, and and to to try to attempt that again, the next book just didn't seem possible. It's like I would just have to get wider in scope and add more points. You know, so I wanted to try to do that. Right. I wanted to do a lot of emotional dredging. I wanted to push myself kind of in the opposite direction, swing the pendulum back to uh, uh, the heart and face from the brain. Things. Yeah, and yeah. and that made it. Uh, I mean. I think equally equally hard to write, and also I think one thing that made this book hard to write is because it's been done. I mean, it's a road novel. I was very resistant to writing a road novel. I mean, Homer wrote a pretty good one. You know what I mean? Twain wrote a good one. Kerouac wrote a good one. There's so like, you know, if you're gonna write something that's been done, you gotta. There's always this pressure to bring something new to the table. You know? Yeah. And, I agree. and in the case of this book, it's like, uh, you know, you can just feel it. The first hundred pages or so, me trying to subvert the the inevitable road novel. I'm trying so hard not to write a road novel, but eventually. The characters drag me kicking and screaming there because they need the road to deliver them. Well, that's funny. You feel that. I didn't as a reader, even though I knew that's where it went. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel that. I mean, I just thought, I mean, my favorite thing about the book is the interaction between Ben and Trev because it's just plain funny. I mean, it's just funny stuff. So I, on that note, there's a perfect transition to what, where we kind of started here, which was, uh, you know, why do people when they go solo sometimes suck? 
And I think it's because they lose that counterpoint. I, I mean, there's exceptions. First albums sometimes are great. Like Frank Black's first album after the Pixies was incredible. Or, you know, like we said, Harrison, McCartney. and Well, they have that, that pent-up frustration. Like, I have this stuff yeah. that I can't do with these guys. And it's kick-ass. And it is. Yeah. And then... And eventually they, they lose that counterpoint because you know left to his own devices Paul Paul McCartney arrived at the synthesizer do you know what I mean and oh, it's yeah. like and a you lot know, of other and he didn't use it as well as the cars or somebody like that no he didn't sort of uh, you know I, so oh, I think that it's absolutely. the counterpoint that's I think that's what's so fascinating about bands and collaboration to a certain extent film I mean you see like great filmmakers often kind of gather the same people for every production you know they're comfortable same actors same yep. DPs the people they're comfortable to work with those those working relationships are something I kind of miss because I had a little background in film and, and a little background in bands and, and there's something special that happens with that collaboration. It's, it's endlessly frustrating. And I mean, I do have it a little bit with, with, with my, in, in different ways, like say with my editor or something like that. Sure, but like, sure. uh, part of me is really relieved not to have to collaborate, but part of me realizes that there's something very special about that too. Oh, I can see both sides of that. I, I, I absolutely can see it. I sort of have the best of both worlds because I do a lot of the writing on my own. And then I get to bring, you know, I get to bring it to other people. And if they like it, then it's. I, I always say to my wife, I'm like, yeah, I sold a song today. You know, I mean, because it means Matt liked it. Matt's very critical. I've worked with Matt for years, plays drums and a lot of other stuff in my band, and and he's just been, he's like the textbook committee. He's like the, you know, but he's, yeah, that's why you need that. An artist needs that. A thin skin artist like bristles when anybody. My my agent never says anything good about my work. I know she loves it. She represents me, but like, I mean, she's hard. I mean, that's why I chose her. You know, I interviewed six agents, and I was right. like, she was the only one that came out and said, "Well, I have some, I have some." Uh, you know, she wanted to make the book that I wanted to write better, and like, you know, she's she's my first line of editorial. So that by the time I get to my editor, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm that much closer. Do you know what I mean? I'm that much closer to my vision, and that's what you got to be careful with with editors. I've been lucky to work with great editors, but Fair there right. are editors that will try to co-op your vision. If your book's a mess. And you, you know, there, there's editors that are going to try to shape it the way they see the book. So, like, the, the onus is on you, the artist, to, like, have people like that. People that will just call you out. I mean, I use lots of readers, like, during the course of, right? I'm not on this book, because the book I'm working on, I'm, I've never been so confident in terms of, I, I guess, because it's just so tightly focused. But, like, you know, I don't, I use five or six readers during the process, which some writers are like, oh, my God, I can't show my stuff to anybody until it's yeah, done. right. I like to. I don't. I don't front load it. I don't say I'm looking to find out this, this, this. I don't ask them specific questions, but based on the feedback I get them and knowing their uh, capacities as readers and their and their you know their tastes and so forth, based on the feedback I get, I can tell whether or not the things I'm trying to accomplish, the effects I'm trying to create, are working. And I find that so. I mean, you know. I mean, again, I think that's something some writers would kind of cringe at, but like for me. Just because I know exactly the book I want to write is and doesn't necessarily mean that I can completely do it on my own. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I can make it better knowing that that you know. That's probably you, you get really rare. close to the you get pretty close to the to the product itself. And like like I say, I never you know I'm very attuned at hearing the stuff that's construct the, the stuff I know is going to help me yes. and then when the other stuff comes I don't bristle no, it's like thanks for the feedback thank but like you yeah. know I think a young writer or a young artist in general tends to get really defensive, defensive yeah, about absolutely. it and, and you know that's one of the first things I would tell a young writer to just get over well you know if you're going to let go of it and put it in the marketplace of ideas as they say in law school then get used to it you might as well start early before you put it in the marketplace get it you know I mean you're lucky that you have people that you trust yeah. who can come to you with feedback that's helpful and it helps you refine what you're doing. Well, and, you, you know, know, I think MFA workshops often are, are designed to sort of try to foster that, but I mean, from what I know about them, and I've never been in one or taught in one or anything, right. I'm not, not, not much of an academic, but I've heard some of the bigger ones are not like that. It's not about fostering, it's about knocking the other guy down, it's very competitive and, and, and very, yeah, uh, you know what same. I mean? I've heard like, the same. So, like, that sounds like a nightmare to me. Oh, well, I was, I was, when I graduated from college, I was considering an MFA in creative writing, and I'm like, wait, what, what, why, why? I, I, I you know, aside from the fact that I turned out really not to be good at writing fiction, it just seemed that was not going to get me any closer to where I wanted to be, so, you know, I mean. I would I, agree you know, with that. I mean, you know, I just, I mean, my thing is, maybe like. maybe it is. I, I don't want to, you know, I'm sure for some people, I will write a workshop and they just 
they catch fire. Oh, I've, right. I've seen notes from some of the instructors at Iowa and they're amazing. But like for me personally, I don't want to demystify the process. You know what I mean? That's why I, I don't feel music. like I yeah, feel like thing. I don't want to uh, I mean, I feel like I could teach, you know, teach somebody how to get where I got, teach them some shortcuts, teach them some basic principles, but all I'm doing is getting them closer to where I want and where I'm at and I think that that's not the point. Do you know what I mean? I right. think trial and error, I think the less somebody is taught, the more they have to grope and struggle and fail, the more the possibility that they're going to arrive at something oh. truly unique. Do you know what I mean? And, I absolutely and, do. And I feel like kind of, it's weird. I feel like that's kind of one of the things that's kind of hurt the novel. Do you know what I mean? I think the MFA has been great for the short story, like because they teach short stories. And mm -hmm. short stories, the dictates are different. It's very different. It's about, I guess, creating an effect and it doesn't have to have this arc. and it, it doesn't even necessarily have to have the same voice and stuff. So I think what we're seeing is, since I feel like academia is kind of like taking, the, taking, taking literature hostage, is that the short story is thriving, like it hasn't in years, yep. but I feel like the novel is suffering. You know what I mean? I, see that. I, could, I, I definitely understand that, and I think that's probably true. I think that, I think you got, yeah, you just gotta feel your way through and go down a lot of dark holes and end up all muddy and covered with dog shit and Try again. That's just the way it is. It's glorious. Uh, I mean, it's the best part. It is. Well, I, and on that note, <laughs> <laughs> we well, could go on forever. Yeah, we could. Except well, we I'm out of beer. Uh, well, that will, we'll rectify that. We're talking with Jonathan Eviston. I'm Michael Kentoff, reporting from Table 28 at uh, Comet Ping Pong in Washington, D.C. A great, a great place. I live close by. It's great to have this in the neighborhood. Great to talk to you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed I, it too. Love the book. Let's and, uh, drink some beers the off, the, uh, off the clock now. All right, man.